We as a church are to be sharing soul food for the world, giving nourishment, spiritual nourishment, to all those around us. You know, food, the food business is a big business. Food giants have capitalized on, well, food. During the pandemic, there were 62 new food billionaires made. Food billionaires. Food is big business. And of course, businesses know that. All throughout the world, you can find all kinds of food. Healthy food, junk food, all kinds of food. When you look at that picture, I start to get a little hungry. <laughs> Maybe a lot hungry. It looks good, but is it soul food? Uh, we call that stuff junk food. Businesses have capitalized on the fat, on the sugar, and on the salt that addict us and keep us coming back for more. That's how they make their billions. And we also know that as we go to restaurants and places of, uh, of eating, we find that we can enter through the golden arches, McD uh, McDonald's. We can enter into DQ for that tasty ice cream where we grill and chill. There are food franchises all over the place. And I found that as we go to these franchises, we sit together and down with our family. It was more about just the food, but it was also to spend time with family, where we would leave the cares of the world and just spend time together over a tasty meal. I found that when you look at the food of this world, there's good food and there's bad food. And then there is soul food. There is food that can spiritually nourish us. The world's greatest soul food enterprise, I believe, is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We share spiritual food for the world. We have franchises like McDonald's and Dairy Queen, but there is one soul food enterprise, and that's the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We share spiritual food for the hungry. We are going to experience what's called the communion service, the Lord's Supper. At this food franchise, we sit together as a family and we share a meal together of bread and grape juice. We believe as Seventh-day Adventists, we believe about an open communion. That means that everyone is welcome to the doors of this soul food franchise. <laughs> invite your friends, invite your family, invite the Baptists, invite whomever your Christian friends are to enjoy a spiritual meal. But it's more than just a spiritual meal. We got bread and juice. It's a little. And so today we may say, people run into the franchises and they go, they put down the money and they get their food. We may say, do we rush into the church? Do we rush into the church saying, hey, deacons and deaconesses, uh, take our money. Church, take our money. You're going to give us some bread and juice. I'm so excited. I'm excited for what's being offered here today. Are you excited about what's being offered here today? Bread and juice? Is that it? Obviously not. There's something more today. There's something special. And so when we go to the blueprint, the blueprint of this enterprise we find in Matthew chapter 26 of Jesus taking bread. And he takes that bread and he says, this is my body. This is the first entree in the spiritual meal. Jesus says, this is my body. Jesus said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. And if any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. You see, there were some, we're offering more than just bread or juice. We're offering the life of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't believe in transubstantiation. I don't believe that when I take a piece of bread, it becomes the literal body of Jesus. No, I believe it symbolizes Jesus' life. It symbolizes his word. It symbolizes more than just his word, but even his grace. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 then says that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He then says, John says, that this Word was full of grace. Full of grace. The Bible says 
that the word is full of grace. What is grace? Grace is an attribute of God exercised towards undeserving human beings. We don't deserve to be at this soul food church. We don't deserve any of God's grace, but because he loves us, he gives it to us. Grace is unmerited favor, unmerited favor, unmerited support and love, unmerited, unmerited support and love. When we receive Jesus as our personal Savior, that is wonderful soul food. It is. When we receive Jesus as our personal Savior, we receive unmerited support from God. Are you getting it, guys? I think you are, right? We're offering more than just bread, but God's grace here today. God is going to pour into us his grace. Yes, that's so awesome. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 12 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. What we're offering today is more than just fast food. We're offering spiritual food for victory over sin. God wants to fill us with his grace so that we can and will be overcomers with him. Grace empowers us. God's grace is the spirit of Christ. It is the spirit of unselfish love and labor for others. God wants to pour into each and every one of us his grace so that we could pour into others. Is your heart empty and open to receive Jesus today? Ah, oh, it is for me, friends. The word says, Jesus said, that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Jesus, even his church, is offering truth here today. And so if we eat the food, well, let me think about it. If we eat real food, it becomes a part of who we are, right? It becomes the flesh on our bones, becomes our hair, and so on. And so as we believe and receive the words of Jesus, they become a part of our spiritual life, and bring light and peace into our souls, joy and strength too, just as food imparts physical strength to us. Now, the second element is the fruit of the vine, the grape juice, which has no alcohol in it. And so the unfermented grape juice is essential. The juice symbolizes Christ's blood. What's so important about Christ's blood? Leviticus says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. In Christ's blood, there is life. When I confess and repent of my sins, Jesus washes away my sins, and he gives me his life. In exchange for my rotten life, he gives me a blood transfusion. Look at this quote. It says, the spiritual life is maintained through faith in the blood of Jesus. It is the efficacy of the blood of Jesus that supplies its every need and keeps the soul in a healthful condition. What we are doing today is essential for our spiritual health. To go turn away from communion, to turn away from the Lord's Supper, to turn away from the foot washing, we are losing a great and wonderful reward. So my question today for us all is, are you hungry yet? Are you hungry for God's word? Are you hungry for God's grace? Are you hungry for God's support? Are you hungry for his life in you? I say yes, I am hungry. And so I remember when back in the day at my parents' house, we'd have hungry man dinners. And the slogan would be, eat like a man. And I remember Job, he was eating spiritual food like a man. He was hungry. He esteemed the words of God's mouth more than his necessary food. He was hungry for Jesus. He was hungry for God. And so when I'm happy, when I'm when I'm happy, oftentimes I'm enjoying a tasty meal. I spend time eating and filling myself as much as I can because I'm hungry. The food tastes so good that I have to just share it with others. I'm just like, yeah, you know what, my wife, I've had this wonderful dessert. I've had this wonderful meal. I've saved a bit just for you. If you're hungry, 
You're not only going to feed yourself, but you're going to share with others that wonderful meal. I share the food with my wife, my daughter, my family, my community. Only the hungry and thirsty receive a blessing. So if you are coming to this communion time, this Lord's Supper time, and you ain't hungry, you're not going to get a blessing. Be hungry. Be healthy in Jesus. Now this time, it's Thanksgiving time. There's this man. This man was part of a company of explorers in Canada. And in 1578, the English explorer Martin Frobisher and his crew gave thanks and communion. And communion was observed at Frobisher Bay in present-day Nunavut. On board of a ship anchored there, Eventually, they would go on to sail to Newfoundland, where they would experience a communion there. Can you imagine what their meals were on that ship? Can you believe that these men were hungry? They thought, they thought salt beef, biscuits, and mushy peas were as tasty. They were like, this food is tasty. Why? Because they were hungry. They gobbled up that food on that ship as they come to a new country. In other words, these explorers were hungry and thirsty. They were ex wanting to experience not only just the food, but the experience of entering a new land. They had entered Canada, and they had discovered it. You and I are explorers. You and I are pilgrims and strangers in this land. And you and I are to be hungry explorers, hungry pilgrims and strangers, feasting on God's word to carry us through this time that we're living in. Here you see in this picture another Thanksgiving. On November 14, 1606, the inhabitants of New France under Samuel de Champlain held a huge feast of Thanksgiving between the local Micmac native tribes and the other French. Though not known at the time by the settlers, cranberries that were rich in vitamin C helped them get well and recover and not have scurvy. This Micmac, these natives, had brought these essential berries to give them health and healing. The French foreigners, they invited the natives to their Thanksgiving table, and they were blessed by the tasty cranberries those guests provided. As heavenly explorers, are we inviting the heathen next door? Are we inviting our community to our communion table? When we do, I believe that we will be blessed as these French explorers were too. Now, I don't know if you've heard the phrase, a family that eats together stays together. That's one happy family enjoying that meal. This Lord's Supper is not just a ritual, it's family time. This is a day where we will build bonds, relationships, and strengthen them over a meal of bread and juice. But sadly, not everyone is experiencing this meal today. There are people today who are spiritually homeless and spiritually hungry. There are millions in this world who are hungering and thirsting after something that they do not know what. People have yet to experience the three angels' messages offered fresh from heaven's bakery. They have yet to experience the fellowship and communion of the saints, of us together today. People have yet to find their spiritual home, the church. Will you be agents to bring in people into this communion supper, even the ones going forward? Now, we cry and we get upset for the starving children in different places, but do we care for those who are spiritually hungry and thirsty? There are people who may not walk around us like that in this world and in this community, but spiritually, they're suffering. Spiritually, they're starving. And God is looking at each and every one of us to provide for them to give them the spiritual food, to give them what they need. People are spiritually starving. But then there are others who are spiritual gluttons. You see this man on the screen? He has enough food for like five people. He is a hungry guy. But he needs to share his food, doesn't he? He should share his meal. You see, we should share, not just be spiritual gluttons, Let's not only just feed ourselves with the word, with our communion bread and wine, but let's fill others. Let's share. God expects us that as much as we fill ourselves with his word, that we get a portion of his grace 
even today, he expects us as we are filled to exercise on what he's given us. God expects us to exercise our faith. When truth got a hold of me, I was led not only to feed myself, but I was led to feed others. At Spicer, I received an education to feed the spiritually hungry. Each one of us, when we go to the Word, we receive not only spiritual food for ourselves, but food for others. And when I was doing research in my thesis study, I researched how to share the health message with, uh, with uh, Christians of other denominations in what, a place called Namdalong in Infal. There I found in my study that people want you in their homes to teach them health, but at the same time, they don't want you in their home. And when I looked at my research, I thought, how does that make any sense? But then I went on to find out that people wanted to watch health presentations. They wanted to learn about health. They wanted to learn spiritual truths and scientific principles for health. So what I found was to be in somebody's home, but not in their home, means that you enter their homes through their television screen, through their cell phones. People wanted to be visited, visited with truth. People are hungry and thirsty. I found plenty of people who wanted truth and who I could have shared communion with, who I could have invited to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. When I was filled with truth, I was led to share. And I hope when you guys are filled with truth, after this communion, that you will be led to share truth with others and invite them to this wonderful church. I went on these mission adventures with my wife through uh, Manipur, through Delhi, through Maharashtra, Pune. And there we did these Bible studies. And that lady in this picture, she was a Baptist lady. And she was our neighbor. And so we would invite our neighbor into our little apartment to have a fellowship meal together, to eat together, but not only just eat together, but to study the Bible together. She didn't speak any English. So what would happen was I would speak English and do the studies, and then her daughter would translate back into Manipuri from English. While I was in, in uh, Pune, I was led to meet these two young ladies, and these two young ladies are my nieces. And these individuals, they had decided to follow Jesus through Bible study, and they were baptized and joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Yeah. God expects us to feed and lead others to this bread table, to this table. Will you work for the Lord? Will you share the truth? When you are filled with the truth and when God pours his grace into you, you'll be led to do some uncomfortable things sometimes. This picture is a, a Bolero SUV. We would take our mission group and we'd fill ourselves into this SUV and we'd pack it full of, uh, of essentials, medical supplies, rice, uh, clothing, you name it, plus our own stuff. And when we would drive hours into the mountains to reach people, we would go where no Seventh-day Adventists would have set their foot. We were, went to places that no one else had gone before in the church. And we had blessed people. We had fed people, and we had prayed with them. We had did children's churches, like we do here today, but in remote places. In this picture, there's me and our team and all these kids. And they all got these uh, Bible story coloring books. Now, they didn't speak English, but they could read and look at the stories and the conference pastor could lead them and help them to understand. We would do these health education seminars where we combined health truths with uh, biblical truths, scientific with the biblical. We were led to get entrance into churches where I would preach the word, even to, into schools like at Jampui Hill. We would go and we would take care of people. We would go and help, offer health care services where we would take their blood pressure and look at if they were uh, suffering from diabetes or had any concerns that we could help them address. And here we would go into these community centers, and these community centers would be a little rough looking, but people would come and we would help them out. We would do whatever we could to help them. When God fed me, I was led to feed others. When God fed me, I was led to witness and bring people into the church for these last days. God, oh, guys, guys, are you on fire for Jesus? Do you realize what God is going to do for you today? 
He's going to fill you up so that you can fill into others. Go and fill people up, friends. On the back of that poster you see at one other community center in Majorong, you see that our slogan there was, here to serve. We were here to serve them so that they could in turn be filled up and serve others. This is one of the highlights of our mission adventures. This is a place called Kesam Kulen. It was in the Kamjong district. Over a period of three days, we served over 200 people. And when we had served these people over a span of three days, we looked after their health concerns. We did house visitations. We provided them rice and blankets because it gets cold up in those mountains. And in these mountains, it's a rough place. People have to go up and down these steep cliffs to gather, fire, to gather firewood. And so they would go through all this heartache and trouble, and they suffer from all kinds of injuries and uh, illnesses as a, as a result of their hard life. And so we went into this dangerous place, and we administered to people. So why am I sharing this all with you today? Why am I doing that? It's because restaurants have servers. Churches have members, members who are there to serve. You see in this picture, we have a deacon giving out some cups with that juice. And there's another server with his bread there, offering it to the one who would come, the one who would be hungry. Are you like that server who has that food, saying, hey, I got something to share with you. Come, sit at my table. Come sit at this table. Come and get yourself a meal at no cost. Brothers and sisters, we are saved to serve. We are saved to serve. The Lord's Supper is more than just a ritual. It's a call to serve soul food to those who are hungry, thirsty, upset, and downtrodden. And so I have appeal for you all today. My appeal is, will you serve soul food? Will you invite our community to come and eat at our table today and in the future?